Would you please bow your heads as we pray? Father God, feed us, for we are hungry for you. Fill us, for we're thirsting for you. We seek your presence, O God, face to face with you as you promise that where you are face to face with us, there's fullness of joy. And where we are side by side with you, there's pleasures forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you please open your Bibles with you to our text for this morning? It will will be projected on the screen, but um, you're welcome to read from your own Bible as well. I will be reading from uh, the New Revised Standard Version, starting with verse verse 9 in Acts chapter 10. Verse 9 is the second of two visions that we find there in uh, in, in, in chapter 10 of the book of Acts. Um, And this second vision is what we're reading to start off our sermon. Acts chapter 10, verses 9 through 16. About noon the, the next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted, wanted something to eat. And while he was, it was being prepared, to, he fell... Um, Sorry, I misread that. Let me begin once, once more. Verse 10. He became hungry and wanted something to eat, and while it was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw the heaven opened and something like a large sheet coming down, being lowered to the ground by its four corners. In it were all kinds of four-footed creatures and reptiles and birds of the air. Then he heard a voice saying, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is profane or unclean. The voice said to him again a second time, What God has made clean, you must not call profane. This happened three times, and the thing was suddenly taken up to heaven. God moves in very mysterious ways. He moves often ahead of his church. And the church does not see where God is moving or has already moved and is making the transformation that, he, he, that he's making. The future he's creating is often beyond our physical ability to, to see, to be able to see until he shows it to us, oftentimes in a vision. And here in this vision, We have a case in which the church grudgingly accepts that what the church was not even thinking of going or doing, God has already done. And where the church was not thinking of going, God has already gone to. And was doing the transformation that he needs in order to bring about the promises, the fulfillment of the promises that he has made come true in Jesus Christ. That in Jesus Christ, there is now no Greek or Jew. There is now no division by ethnicity. There is now no division by whatever division we might choose to have or create among ourselves as as human beings. That those divisions have ceased to exist because in Jesus Christ, we are all one and the same. And as I look in front of me, I see different people coming from different places, different colors, from different walks of life. And this has become true because Jesus Christ is king, and he is king over a very different kind of kingdom, a kingdom that is so unlike the kingdoms of this world. God moves ahead of his church, shows the church what he is doing, and he shows that often in a vision. And here in this vision, a vision that is very familiar to us Adventists for more reasons than one, we like to take you know, uh, we like to take people who, um, or no, I don't want to say argue with people, discuss with people about the fact that, you know, this church is, I mean, this, this chapter is often, um, uh, you know, often uh, uh, referred to um, by other uh, Christians um, and well-meaning Christians at that and telling us that all food is clean and, and God has cleaned all foods. And so that's normally where we take, you know, how we understand this, this uh, or our contact uh, with, with this chapter. But here in this chapter, what we have is 
God showing the young church what it truly means to be a missional church. What it truly means to reach outside of our comfort zone. And rather than asking people to come to us to go to them, as God has already reached them ahead of us. This past September, for the second time, I went up on uh, the summits of Mount Talak. How many of you have been to Mount Talak? About four summers ago, I went with a couple of uh, my friends. As a matter of fact, Tim. I don't see Tim here today. Is it, are you here? here, Tim? He's here. He's in potluck with... Uh, his beautiful wife, of course, with Tim and his, uh, and his neighbor, Dave. We went up, and uh, it took us several hours to get up there, and it was fantastic. And I decided to go, uh, and I, took, I, I was going to take Micah, my son, with me, our son with me, but he decided that he wanted to stay, stay down in the valley, uh, uh, and he was waiting for his friends because he wanted to go fishing with his friends. And he said, Dad, I've had a long week, and I don't really want to go up there. And so I ended up going up there alone. And I started going up there around 9.30, 9.45 in the morning. And um, so I started going up, and I should have posted a few of the pictures that I... But you know, you know Mount Talak, and you know the area. Um, it's very close to the area where we go camping as a church. Um, it's the, the, the highest peak in that part, uh, in, in that part of, of Tahoe. So I went up there, and Mike was too tired. He, so he fished with his friends, so he said... And as soon as, as soon as I got up to the top, I remember how it was the first time, how the stunning, stunningly beautiful view, 360 degree panoramic, breathtaking panoramic view of the surrounding valley. If you start from the north, you will see uh, the, 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 the northern tip of Lake Tahoe and you go clockwise down, you will see the beautiful trees and the, and the hues of, you know, the ups and downs of the valleys and the... And the um, and the, uh, the hills, and, and down below, down, right around, probably around 5 o'clock to where I was standing, um, you could see uh, the, camp, the, the campground where all of you, most all of you were at that time. And you keep going on a clockwise motion, and, and, and as soon as you hit south and southeast, um, you start to see the desolation wilderness. And I remember the three, four night camping that my, me and my son did just a few uh, months before that, or a a year before that, there at the Desolation Wilderness, a beautiful panoramic view of Lake Tahoe and the Desolation Wilderness. Today I said, to those of you that received the email that we send out every week, that today I'm going to be um, spelling out or, or, uh, or, or um, laying down our vision for 2024 and beyond. What is vision anyway? Vision is like being on, on top of or on the summit of Mount Talak and getting, having a glimpse of the surrounding view, the surrounding environment. Except that when it comes to vision, the vision, the kind of vision that I want to talk about today, we're really trying to glimpse into the future or at least perhaps even the present that God is creating and, by, and, and by, by implication, the future that he's creating beyond the present that he has already created. Vision is a glimpse into the future. That's what vision is, a lot, a lot like, you know, the, vision that's, the visions that the prophets received from God in times of old. But vision is also like a drawn arrow. You remember, if you read the email that I sent out, that that is the analogy that I that I used. That if you could look at, if you could see vision in a, in a different way, it would be like a drawn arrow, or I should say, bow with an arrow in it, and it's aimed at at, at a target. That is a vision. Another way of looking at vision is that is the path we choose to reach the goal we have set for ourselves or the goal that God has set for us. Or another way of looking at it is that vision is something, is, is our purpose, I mean, is, is, our, is our pathway to fulfilling the purpose that God has created us for. 
And the, and the word for that purpose is mission. If you look in the back of your bulletin, you will find the mission that we have set for ourselves, taking that specifically from Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, the great gospel commission. And so I'm, I boiled down the, um, our mission statement to this. Our mission is to make disciples until Jesus returns. Simple enough, isn't it? To make disciples until Jesus returns. Look in the back of your building, that's what it's saying. So mission, is that is our goal, our, our reason for existence. The reason why we're all here as a church. And Auburn's mission is simple enough, very, uh, very easy to remember. It doesn't take much to, uh, to memorize this. What is it again? Close your eyes. To make disciples until Jesus returns. But in order for that mission to be accomplished, we need a pathway. We need a, uh, we need a drawn bow with an arrow in it. We need a vision, a pathway to reach our destination. But even before that, we need to, to look at some ways in which we could do things probably um, a little bit differently than we have been doing them before. Perhaps to look at the same mission statement that we've looked at for, you know, ever since we've coined this mission statement and find some new ways at looking of, of, of reaching that goal or realizing, fulfilling that mission. And today I wanna, I wanna propose to you five things, shifts as I call them and um, I, uh, and and um, shifts in our in our in our vision, in order for us to fulfill our mission. And these five shifts are not uh, mine originally. I drew them from this book that we're going to be using a lot this year, uh, especially the uh, the uh, the 1923 project, the microchurch project that we've started. Uh, I'm going to be um, going through this book with them, and hopefully through with the rest of you, with all of you, with all of us. 180, A Return to Disciple Making, a, a book that, that was uh, written by Dave Ferguson, as well as this book written by an Adventist pastor by the name of Sean, Pastor Sean Brace. And the title of the book is The Table I Long For, Learning to Participate in the Mission and Family of God. I want to propose to you, I want to propose to you that these five shifts are necessary for us to be able to look at this mission and perhaps even, you know, in, in, in some small way, redefine and reinvigorate and renew this mission that we have to make disciples until Jesus returns, or at least to make one disciple before the end of the year, of this year, for each of us as a, as a personal goal. What are these five shifts? I want to take you them through, uh, through, through these five shifts uh, rather quickly. The first shift, vision shift that is necessary, I believe, is this. Shift number one, we envision a shift from just reaching people to making disciples. What would, be, what would it be like to have a church in which we are not just reaching people, but also reaching in order to make them into disciples of Jesus Christ? It seems sometimes to be kind of a, a, a no-brainer, but sometimes I think we do forget that our mission is to make disciples, not simply to reach people for Jesus Christ. We envision a shift from reaching people to making disciples of Jesus Christ. And I want to uh, propose to you that those two things, reaching and making disciples, are not necessarily synonymous with each other. And I will show you, and I will, I'll, I'll show you uh, a little bit later what I mean by that. A, sec a second shift that needs to happen is this, is this. We envision a shift from merely informing disciples to equipping disciple makers. Often, church devolves into a matter of informing, perhaps me informing you. Whenever I stand up here and preach, 
the gospel, the, the word of God before you, I'm informing you. Disciple making is a lot more than that. It's all about equipping the person who comes to listen to the word of God week after week, who interfaces with God and with each other day after day. So we envision a shift from merely informing disciples to equipping them to be disciple makers. A third shift that needs to happen is this. We envision a shift from calling people to attend programs and events to attaching deeply to God and people. Don't get me wrong, I appreciate your presence here every single week, every single Sabbath. And of course, we will continue to, to encourage you to keep coming to the programs of this church for our own good. For your own good and for my own good. I still remember those terrible dark days of the pandemic when I was preaching here and you were nowhere to be found because you were home. I was all alone here, not exactly all alone. It was me, Mark, and Scott. And I was preaching to an empty church. And it was just about the worst thing that a pastor could ever go, could ever, could, could ever experience. And you remember that I was also the, the start, start of, the, of the bread ministry that has now evolved to something else. When I started thinking to myself, how am I going to survive not seeing the people that God has called me to, to minister to? And so I started collecting you, you guys' as old bread makers. Remember that? And I started collecting them and I started making bri bricks before I started making bread. And I started going out and and knocking at your door, and I wouldn't go into your homes, of course, because it was COVID. But I would hand you bread, and I got to see your faces. And my mood would change. I did it for me as much as I did it for you. It is all right. It is not bad to want to call people to attend programs and events. But as a church, we want to go beyond that. We want to do that, but we also want to go beyond that to encouraging people not only to come to the programs and then go home and never see each other again until next week, but to become deeply attached, not just to God, of course, first of all, to God, on a daily basis, but also to people on a daily basis. That's what church is all about. That's what that is for. We worship, we connect, we serve. No man is an island. We cannot survive. And COVID, if there's anything that COVID has taught me, it is that I, even as an introvert, need all of you to survive. And the same with you. You, we need each other to not just survive, but to thrive in, in God, in Jesus Christ. So I would like to see this shift happening, starting to happen or become more and more a reality in our church, in Auburn Church and beyond to envision a shift from calling people to attending programs and events, from attending programs and events to attaching deeply to God and to people to make each other, to make other people your friends. There is a fourth shift that I'd like to propose, and that is this. We envision a shift from striving to thriving as spirit-empowered disciples and emotionally healthy leaders. A lot of times we strive, and a lot of times we strive unhealthily. I do admit and I must confess that that often is not the case here at Auburn Church. I'm not saying this because I'm the pastor in this church, but I've been a pastor for over 20 years, 25 years. As a matter of fact, I keep saying 20 years. I've been saying that the last few years, and I don't want to, I don't want to change 20 years because I, it makes me look really old. 27. 27 years? Has it been 27 years? All the striving that I saw in the different churches that I've been in, 
seem to be absent here. This is a good church. A church made up of people that actually love other people, that actually want to spend time with each other. I've never seen it in, in any of the churches that I've been in, to be honest with you, except maybe for one. Paradise Valley in San Diego. What would it be like to shift from un, unhealthy striving to thriving as spirit-empowered disciples and intentionally creating emotionally healthy disciple-makers, emotionally healthy leaders within the church? I confess to you, volunteers, that I've not done enough in order to help you become more emotionally healthy, perhaps. I want to do better next, this year, not next year, this year. And I want us to do better together this year. And the last of these five shifts is shift number five. We envision a shift from accumulating people into our buildings and attracting them into our programs to deploying the disciple-making disciples. That's kind of a, a mouthful, isn't it? Disciple-making disciples into our neighborhoods. That's going to be a major shift. And that, that is a shift that will not happen overnight. It will be an incremental shift. And we will keep shifting because you see what? Well, our mission statement is not, it's not a, a place where we can arrive to. It's a process, and an ongoing process that never ends. It keeps going, and we get better and better at it. We get better and better at, at, at making disciples for Jesus until he comes. We never arrive, really. We only get better at it. And one of the shifts that needs to happen for that to become a more and more a reality among us is a shift from accumulating people into our buildings not that that is bad. Once again, it's not bad. It's good. But the shift from not just doing that, but also from, uh, from attracting them into, into our programs to deploying people that we have trained to be disciple makers so that they themselves can make disciples through Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. De to make disciple making disciples and to deploy them into the neighborhoods. Not just to come here so we can sing kumbaya to each other before God. However good that may be. And it is good. Because you see, this place here is our pit stop. This is our gas station. This is where we get filled up for the next week of worshiping out there, of connecting out there, of serving out there in our neighborhoods. That is where it counts. And in Acts chapter 10, you know, um, the, 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 in, in, in the vision that, that, I, um, that, that, that we, we read here, you, you, um, you may um, obs have observed that God did not ask Cornelius to go to Peter. God asked Peter to go to Cornelius because God was already discipling Cornelius and he was ready to, to make the next move. And when Peter reaches Joppa that day or the following day, Cornelius was there waiting. Verse 24 tells us, and, 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 and the follow, and following verses, it's, it says, The following day they came to Caesarea, that is Peter and his companions. He grudgingly, he grudgingly went because God told him to go. He still didn't understand what he meant by that sheet of all of those animals, clean and unclean, and telling, telling him to eat. He didn't mean it li literally. He didn't mean it to be food, of course. We know that. He meant people. So he sends them to the people that he dislikes because they're not Jews. They're not like him. And then when he reaches those people, Cornelius had already done what God had told him to do. God was making disciples, making disciples 
be, uh, even, even before Peter reached them, God was already doing that. Listen, here, here's what it says, verse 24. The following day they came to Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together, had called together his relatives and close friends. He was ready, Cornelius was ready to make disciples himself as he was being discipled by the Lord. And that's what it's going to take. It is not enough for us to just make disciples. It should be for us to make disciples who make other disciples. Who make other disciples? Who make other disciples? Ad infinitum. And so I want to propose to you this morning that there's, no, there's not, not just these five vision shifts for us to accomplish our mission. I want to propose to you a renewed mission. And here it is. A renewed mission ought to be to make disciples who make other disciples until Jesus returns. Which means your task and my task is not just to invite people to come here and for you to show up yourself. My task and your task is to disciple somebody so that that person will in turn disciple someone else. And that person will disciple someone else. And on and on. To the end of the world. So these are the five shifts. Very simple. Once again, we envision a shift from just reaching people to making disciples. We envision a shift from merely informing disciples to equipping disciple makers. We envision a shift from calling people to attend program and events to truly becoming attached to God and people. We envision a shift from unhealthy striving to thriving as spirit-empowered disciples and emotionally healthy leaders. And last, we envision a shift from accumulating people into our buildings and attracting them into our programs to deploying people as disciple-making disciples away from the walls of this church to the neighborhoods surrounding this church. And with these five shifts, we go back to our very simple disciple-making process. It's also in the back of your bulletin. Our path to making disciples, we've made it simple for everyone to be able to carry out daily and weekly. We worship, we connect, we serve. Easy. Now we just need to get better at doing all three. And that's what we're committing to doing or continuing to do this year and beyond. Our path to making disciples who make other disciples remain the same and remain simple. Show up at church. Connect with more and more people with the intent of not just inviting them to come here, but with the intent of making them disciple-making disciples. And then serve your community where they need it most. These three things, very simple. And together, we can do it. And so our simple discipleship-making process really boils down to this. We aim to make disciples who make other disciples by growing in the way we worship together, connect with one another. When, when I mean one another, not just one another here, as I, I just said, but to connect with more and more people outside of our circles and to serve 
others. One step at a time, we begin the shifts today, but it doesn't end today. We begin it this year, but it doesn't end at the end of the year. We never fully arrive, but we keep, keep at it until Jesus comes. This is our bond with each other. This is our bond with our Savior and Lord. And the promise is, with the Holy Spirit helping us, empowering us, we will be, we are already, more than conquerors. What is our mission again? To make disciples who make disciples of others, or other disciples, until Jesus comes. And how do we do that? We worship, we connect, we serve. How often do we do that? Once in a while? Every day. Every day. Who do we connect to? With God, of course, but with others within and outside of our circles. Who do we serve? Anyone who needs help. That is our bond with each other. That is our bond with God. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can all do it. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you that through the Holy Spirit, we are enabled to be your witnesses in the world. Help us to fulfill our mission together. And help us to worship you, to learn to worship you better each day, to connect with others better each day, to serve others better each day. In Jesus' name. And bless the food we're about to eat. In Jesus' name. Amen.